Mitch, thanks so very much. Um, thank you also for the invitation to share with folks today uh, the work from a nursing perspective on the environment and how it intersects with all of the presentations that have happened before me. And toward the end of my presentation, I'll thread in um, the previous talks and why the work we're currently doing at NYU Myers is related to everything that's been discussed today. Once I get my screen to go, we'll be good. Sorry for the technical difficulty here. There we go. Um, so as I, <laughs> I have no conflicts of interest to disclose, sorry about, about the uh, delay. So I just wanna share that at the end of the presentation, I'm hoping that uh, the attendees will appreciate the dynamics of the environment and climate and its evolving influence on our practice, no matter what our practice is. And also um, that we have an ability to reflect on our career to date and the intersection of the environment and climate on our practice, research and decision-making. So speaking of career to date, as one individual, that is in the nursing profession and has been in the nursing profession for many decades, I really wanted to share with you a bit of a timeline and then I'll go through the specifics on the timeline as far as how the environment and the evolution of my appreciation and integration of the environment in my practice has moved forward. So in my master's program, I was um, in a master's program for community health nursing. So very similar to many of you from a public health environmental health perspective. While I was in my graduate program, I ran for political office and it was a contested race and I won. And that put me on the board of health in a local municipality in uh, the state of Massachusetts. In that local municipality, I served on the board of health and most of the um, water and disposal systems were um, septic systems and um, local water systems, wells. And my responsibility there was really to, on my way to my pay job, is to stop by um, homes that were under construction and examine the septic systems for the percolation rate. That was the beginning of my appreciation and understanding of the importance of percolation rate. And that's gonna come way back around um, to the end of this presentation. Um, I've been a member of the American Public Health Association since 1980, and my primary group has always been the environment. While I am a nurse, my focus is the environment as a nurse. Um, in 2003 to 14, I focused on interprofessional education um, with medicine and nursing students on oral health. And the environmental component that we looked at there was water, and in particular, water fluoridation. Uh, from 2006 to 2010, we did some research on women's health and practice in Ghana. Uh, 2011 to 2012, I did some postdoctoral training uh, focusing on lymphatic filariasis in Papua New Guinea. And then to, to 2014 to present, I've been working on capacity building projects in Rwanda, Ghana, and Liberia, really focusing on potable water, dialysis, and sanitation. And now I'll share the stories of each of these components so that you can see how one nurse, and I'm just one member, examines the environment and appreciates the environment and its impact on healthcare workers, but also the client populations that we serve. So beginning with my work at um, in the interprofessional education on oral health and water fluoridation, the biggest learning from this experience was that the medical students and the graduate nursing students had no appreciation of the origins of their water, where the water came from originally out of their taps. This was very important because we were talking to them about 
assessing clients water source and if the water was fluoridated or not. So living in um, North Central Massachusetts, working in New York City, but living in North Central Massachusetts, we have the um, Quabbin Reservoir, which was a man-made reservoir, and it transfers water by, um, by natural decline. Um, so it's naturally filtered, and it lands up in a water treatment facility in, um, just outside of Boston. For the, this interprofessional education experience, we brought all of the graduate uh, nursing students and medical students to this water treatment facility so that they could understand and appreciate all that goes into filtering water, monitoring water to make sure that that water is safe and potable for the people that reach that water in their daily and work lives. Um, layered on top of this was my dissertation work. And to look at the title, you would say, you know, what's she talking about? Um, so the title was um, the interrelationship among interpersonal and community situational influences on the use of health promotion behaviors in urban women. And the critical piece that was the aha was the community situational influences. To get to this, I had to bring in another model to explain the model that I was using, which I'll share in a minute. But the exciting part of this dissertation work, being a member of the American Public Health Association, was when I presented my work at the APHA conference in San Francisco in 2003, remembering that I was always a member of the environmental health section. And this is where, in the poster presentation with students from other environmental health programs, uh, I think I was the only nurse, uh, was my aha moment because the students came around to each of our posters and we did theirs and they said, wow, you did your dissertation work on the built environment. I had no idea that that was the concept that I was investigating because it wasn't a term that was used in nursing and in nursing science. The environment is a, a really important domain the concept of the built environment was unknown to me. This took my career to another whole level, this aha moment. This is the model that I used. So I was looking at health promoting behaviors. Um, I stratified according to uh, uh, crime statistics, but in Pender's model, these situational influences, um, options available, demand characteristics and aesthetics were very poorly explained. So I needed the social ecology model to better explain those components um, in the um, top part of the model. These are the components that really got me to examine the built environment. And I'll get into a little bit more detail on that in a, in a minute. So after my um, doctoral program, I worked at the University of Massachusetts Worcester. And in the early um, 2000s, Worcester discovered that we had the highest infant mortality rate in the state. And it was like, that doesn't make any sense because oftentimes Boston had the highest infant mortality rate. So when we looked at the, the data and we were very fortunate in that we had a retired neonatologist that looked at every single death record. And the, uh, the conclusions in looking at all those death records were that every child that died their mom was an immigrant from Africa and primarily from Ghana. So a colleague and I, I look at um, health, public health from a woman's focus. And my colleague was a women's health nurse practitioner. And we said we needed a road trip to Ghana to discover how women were keeping themselves well and how many of those behaviors they transferred over to um, central Massachusetts. While there, uh, it was an ethnographic study. So we lived and worked in the community. Uh, we went back three times over three and a half years. We really got to know more about the community than just our study. We, we communicated with, with women and how they kept themselves well. One of the biggest issues um, that they defined for us was their access to potable water, to safe water. Um, while they had, um, bore holes that were dug and were accessible from a water source, the women didn't use the water because it tasted terrible and they needed a lot more detergent um, when they were using that water. 
we worked with the uh, health commission in, in town, um, looking at the diseases that uh, non-potable water were creating in the community. And as it states here in Ghana, um, the conditions that are related to water and sanitation are malaria, malnutrition, and diarrheal diseases. As we were talking with the women, they did identify that their health priority was access to safe water. Um, and the women were very um, forward thinking and they advocated for themselves. They were able to get a water treatment filtration system installed in the village that we were working in, in Fakwasi, Ghana. And when we went back two years later and saw the water filtration system, I asked the district nurse if she had seen a decline in waterborne illnesses. And she said, especially diarrheal diseases in children had plummeted. So again, bringing safe water to the community made a huge impact on the, on the, um, visitor, uh, the uh, residents of the community. My, my postdoc work brought me to Papua New Guinea and water just keeps following me wherever I go in my career. So while I'm interested and in, it's really hard to disconnect water from soil and from air, the, the primary focus has been on water. So in Papua New Guinea, another low resource country, uh, we again looked at the balance between water and waste. My, dis my postdoc work in Papua New Guinea focused on the disease lymphatic filariasis, which is transmitted by mosquito. And again, in Papua New Guinea, there are heavy rain seasons and the water does not drain well related to the composition of the soil. So thus the transmission of, the, um, of lymphatic filariasis. But I lived in the community um, with, with members of the community and on the weekends, we would go to do laundry in this pond where this small child is standing. When I was there, the time that I was there was a pretty severe drought. And so you can see that the water level is very low. And natural instinct, but natural instinct based on previous lived experience, this child was about to void in this stream of water. And before the child could even cons consider voiding, the, the mom quickly swept the child up and pushed the child further away from the water source. So in these communities, they appreciate the transmission of disease in the, in the water that they drink, and they make sure that they protect their water um, from small children on up. Um, also to share, in Papua New Guinea, during the field work that we were doing there, I visited many communities, and there was an initiative going on um, to build uh, latrines and toilets so that people would not be experiencing open defecation. The only problem is that the toilets were built and money was given to the communities, but it didn't change the behavior of the people. What's really important to appreciate, however, is that 2.4 billion people lack access to basic sanitation services, such as toilet and latrines, and they make a huge impact on the soil and the filtration into the water stream. Uh, again, uh, the work in Papua New Guinea really looked at um, the transmission of lymphatic filariasis. I was very fortunate to go out with the entomology team and collect samples of larvae in the standing water that was there. This is a group of young girls that were on their way home from school. They saw what we were doing and came over and they were actually better at collecting the samples than we were. Um, the the uh, person on the right-hand side of your screen with just the legs showing is an example of a client that I worked with in the first three months of my postdoc training, um, instituting a feasibility study on the impact of um, some World Health Organization exercises and behaviors to decrease the disability of lymphatic filariasis. And when I saw her seven months later, she came up to me and shared that the exercises and the activities that she was doing had actually brought down the swelling of lymphatic filariasis. When we talk here uh, today about occupational and environmental health, Disability is a huge component, and many of you have discussed it already today, the disabilities that are caused and the impact that that has on work. 
And lymphatic filariasis is one of those disabilities um, that prevents people from going to work. It also, uh, from a disability perspective, is impacted by the stigma of the swelling, the lower limb swelling from lymphatic filariasis. So this work and the attention to this, um, this particular condition, it's a neglected tropical disease, is really important. And in 2022, it was determined that the efforts that are, that are um, in process to eliminate lymphatic filariasis, which really is a multi, multiple drug regime um, for, the, for the humans um, to eliminate the, um, the, the, the swelling and the disability, has seen a 244 million person DALI decrease. So the efforts are very, very successful, um, decreasing the disability and therefore increasing the functionality of people making a living and going to work. I had to transition my built environment lens when I had a, a, a PhD student that had a lot of experience in healthcare design. So this is my transit, my layering on, not a transition, but a layering on of my appreciation and understanding of the healthcare built environment. So with the work with um, now Dr. Susan O'Hara, uh, we looked at the um, healthcare built environment in a very large um, healthcare facility on the East Coast. And she really looked at the design of the healthcare um, built environment on the macrocognition of people working together and making connections. What she discovered in her work is that the, the design of healthcare environments are really set up as neighborhoods and the design of the environments impact um, how people communicate, how people collaborate. As a result of her work, this was a brand new PICU um, in a highly regarded healthcare uh, facility on the East Coast, um, they made interventions based on her work so that there could be a better line of sight uh, with, the, with the patient in the bed and better communication with all members of the healthcare team. Working in collaboration with Dr. O'Hara and um, another colleague, we submitted an AHRQ grant at the, um, at the height of the pandemic. Um, it was scored, but not funded, which happens often. But this is taking the healthcare built environment and looking at it from a community oriented healthcare built environment with um, nursing home residents. So we had developed a proposal for rapid deployment um, housing to temporarily foster at risk nursing home residents. And we labeled it the community oriented healthcare built environment. So my career has seen these transitions and transformations of the environment um, as it relates to the work that I do. Currently at New York University, I am involved in uh, nursing workforce capacity building in Rwanda, Rwanda, Ghana, and Liberia. And I've been very fortunate to be able to go to these countries and work with a faculty that we've hired at NYU to provide education and, pra and practice and care in these countries. In Rwanda, um, I've been very fortunate to work with a colleague whose expertise is in um, kidney care. And she is uh, the lead faculty member in a master's program in nephrology. And she took me around to the dialysis centers in Rwanda. And in each of the dialysis centers, whether they were public or, or private, I got to see and ask the questions about the potability of the water that they were using in their dialysis centers. And as to be expected, and um, thank you, uh, Mike, for your conversation on diversity, inclusion, and equity, um, you could really see the, the, um, the inequality in the dialysis centers and the care that they were providing based on the potability and the safety of the water. In the private dialysis center, I asked the question at every center, but at the private dialysis center, when I asked what the source of the water was, the nurse that was doing the tour didn't answer me right away. So at the end of the tour, she said, I did not forget your questions. And she brought me out to a courtyard in the back of the facility and they had their own well in the, in the courtyard so that they could assure, uh, and it was a deep well, so that they could assure the quality of the water. 
And I asked her, I said, this is Rwanda, power outages happen a lot. So how do you ensure that you have quality water for your dialysis when the, when the power goes out? And she asked me to turn to the right and they had their own generator. So again, an equity issue around care, around the environment, around the element of water in the environment um, came front and center in Rwanda. In Ghana, in that village that I shared with you that we worked in, they had this water treatment facility. However, I keep up to date um, with, the, with the management of that water treatment facility. And 11 years later, they still do not have the community um, accepting the management of that water treatment facility. So there's some policy issues when we're talking about the environment, when we're talking about climate related to health um, that we have to still work through. My most current work has been in Liberia. And we've had a lot of experience going into the healthcare facilities, especially in Monrovia. And the largest public healthcare facility in Monrovia has very, very limited water. Um, and the water that's there is dependent on the electricity that is generated. Um, from an occupational safety perspective, um, it would, might raise your hair. Um, about the cables and the wires that all the employees, all the visitors have to step over that are supporting the generators from space to space to space um, in, in that healthcare facility. Also, um, the issue of potable water came up again with one of our visiting faculty. Um, she contracted typhoid twice while she was working in Liberia. And typhoid is endemic in Liberia. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of conversation from the Ministry of Health perspective about getting um, better dis, dis diffusion of vaccines um, for typhoid, but it is endemic. And as I say, this uh, visiting faculty member contracted it twice. So I'm very fortunate um, to work with colleagues at NYU Myers in the T42 Center that we have there on environmental and occupational health. Um, it's been a joy and a pleasure to kind of bring my climate and environmental perspective to nursing with and to my colleagues there at the T42 Center. We were very fortunate just before the pandemic to receive a, an NYU Curriculum Challenge Grant and a colleague at the T42 Center calling you out, Amy Stimple, and another colleague work together to create a brand new course called the Environment and Health of Populations. We had a couple of years of interruption with a pandemic, but we are finally implementing this brand new graduate course this semester. The unique component of the unique uh, pedagogy of this course is that we're teaching it in three modules. So the first three modules are on air, soil, and water. And I'm teaching those three modules. And we feel as though it's very important for nurses to appreciate and understand the elements that make up the climate first. So the first week we had a discussion on soil. Uh, this past Wednesday, we had a discussion on air. Particulate matter was a very high topic within that presentation. And next week we'll have a, um, a, a presentation on water. Then Amy Stimple will bring her expertise forward um, in discussing the built environment and the healthcare built environment. And then another colleague of ours, um, Dr. Stacey Keating, will follow up in those last module on um, issues around climate and climate mitigation. It's been really exciting to work with these two other two colleagues to bring this course to the College of Nursing to bring back to nurses and nursing students, the importance of air, soil, and water and how they make up the climate and impact the climate. This cumulative expertise has been absolutely amazing. Finally, um, just to remind everyone, the, as we have talked about today already, the environment and the climate are dynamic. As professionals, we need a greater awareness of this dynamism and the impact influence and influence on our stakeholders is imperative. Thank you for your time and attention.